Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Philip Bloom. I'm the June and Simon Casey Lee Curator of the Chinese Garden at the Huntington, where I'm also the director of our Center for East Asian Garden Studies. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's lecture by Dr. Roslyn Lee Hammers from the University of Hong Kong. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Hammers, for joining us so early in the morning in Hong Kong. Um, I'd like to offer my particular thanks to the Justin Vanya Memorial Fund for underwriting our East Asian Gardens lecture series. So our speaker today, Dr. Uh, Hammers, is Associate Professor of Chinese Art History at the University of Hong Kong. Dr. Hammers is a specialist in the representations of labor and technology and Chinese visual culture. She received her PhD at the University of Michigan and taught at Whitman College in Washington State before moving to Hong Kong about 15 years ago, where she teaches courses on all aspects of pre-modern Chinese art, including what sounds to me like a fascinating investigation of land and gardens in Chinese art. Over the course of her career, uh, Dr. Hammers has developed truly really a remarkable body of scholarship on Chinese representations of agriculture and other forms of technology. Her first book, um, Pictures of Tilling and Weaving, Art, Labor, and Technology in Song and Yuan, China, was published by Hong Kong University Press in 2011. And it examines a series of paintings and poems that document the processes of cultivating rice and producing silk. And through painstaking textual research and also close examination of images, Dr. Hammers shows that these paintings and poems really thematize the proper relationship between officials and farmers, in other words, between a government and the governed. And consequently, these works really became significant tools of political commentary during the 12th to 14th centuries. Building on the Song and Yuan foundations of her first book, uh, Dr. Hammers has recently turned to the Qing dynasty um, from the 17th to early 20th centuries to examine imperial sponsorship of depictions of agricultural labor. And in particular, she's been considering how pictorial representation, technological innovation and imperial ideology intersected in the 18th century. Um, her second book, The Imperial Patronage, Patronage of Labor Genre Paintings in 18th Century China um, was just published by Rutledge about six weeks ago. And it's to celebrate this exciting new work that we invited Dr. Hammers to speak today. But the timing of um, today's lecture is actually especially fortuitous for us at the Huntington. Um, just yesterday, a small group of staff donors and carpenters gathered to commemorate the raising of the ridge pole of a project that we're tentative, tentatively calling the Japanese Heritage House. This is a 320 year old residence that's coming from Marugame in Japan. And it was donated to the Huntington by the Yokoi family who had lived in the structure for 12 generations, serving as the heads of their village. The timber frame of the house was disassembled and conserved in Japan before being shipped to the Huntington last spring. And it's now being reassembled by teams of artisans from Japan as well as um, by local construction workers. And after construction is completed over the next two years, the house and its surrounding landscape will become the centerpiece in new programs focused on horticultural sustainability. As part of that landscape, we've actually been considering developing a rice paddy uh, to teach visitors about the foundations of agriculture and really life more generally in East Asia. Historically, as um, Dr. Hammers will discuss today, small rice paddies were sometimes included in a variety of gardens throughout East Asia, from royal gardens in Seoul to warriors parks in Japan. And they functioned on the one hand as a kind of ethical reminder to garden owners that they owed their very existence to agriculture, but they also provided important spaces for annual rituals um, that were intended to ensure good harvests or continued prosperity. Variations on these rituals existed in China, Japan, and Korea. They sometimes involved both riziculture, which was conventionally seen as a male activity, and also sericulture, um, which was conventionally pursued by women. And so to that end, I'm really hoping that at the Huntington we'll end up pairing our rice paddy with a grove of mulberry trees, um, if not necessarily with a brood of silkworms. And in doing so, I think we'd be able to tell a very important story about the intersections of agriculture and gender in East Asia. 
So given all of this, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Hammers today to speak about the labor of good governance, cultivation real and imagined in the imperial garden of clear ripples in 18th century China. Um, after the lecture today, we'll have a Q&A session. So throughout Dr. Hammer's talk, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on your device. And I'll pose your questions to Dr. Hammer's after her talk. And please also note um, that closed captioning is available. Um, you can activate it by clicking on the closed captioning box at the bottom or top of your screen. So. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosalind Lee Hammers. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Bloom. I really uh, greatly appreciate that. Um, that's probably the most exciting introduction I've ever had, just because um, the things, the projects that you were hiring at the Huntington is with this Japanese uh, architectural structure coming in um, gives me even more reasons uh, to want to come to uh, the Huntington. And as you know, I wish I could be there today to talk in person, but of course, um, I'm very pleased and very honored uh, to have this ability to uh, talk uh, today, even if it's uh, virtually. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Michelle uh, Bailey and, and Dr. Bloom for inviting me and for facilitating this talk here. Um, okay, uh, let's see, I'm gonna, share screen. Uh, I hope this works. I'm always getting nervous. Okay, share. And hopefully you can see the uh, PowerPoint. I'm going to get rid of my face. I'm going to try to move that away. And uh, here we are um, at the at the uh, starting page. Okay, so I'm going to start my story of the labor of good governance in the year of 1698 uh, during the Qing dynasty. Um, the Qing era is from uh, 1644 to 1911 or 12. And I, I, I want to be mindful that audience members may not know the names or the orders of the Chinese dynasty. So I'm gonna attempt to have the dynasty names and dates on the slides when I mention them. Um, we are going to be jumping around across history um, in my talk of about 45 minutes. Um, so I hope I am clear. Um, and as uh, uh, Dr. Bloom has mentioned, I will be very happy to take talk uh, to take questions after the talk. So um, please feel very free to welcome them. Um, so what happens is in the Qing dynasty in 1689, the Kangxi emperor took a tour of the South he took a tour of the South. Um, they're called a Southern, and he took many of them, but he took one particularly in 1689, and this is called the Southern Inspection Tour. Uh, these were opportunities to show uh, the, the, his, his authority and to gauge in promoting the somewhat new Qing government to the public. Uh, to the, and he would be you know, making appearances in front of his citizens and taxpayers. Uh, Southern China, had just been completely conquered with no vestiges of the former Ming dynasty. So it's rather new that he's going there. Um, during his tour in Suzhou, the Kangxi emperor was given a version of the pictures of tilling and weaving, um, that would be the Gungjir tool. And in receiving this gift, he set the stage for my talk today. I'm going to introduce the Kangxi emperor and the pictures of tilling and weaving to then focus uh, more on Kangxi's grandson, the Qianlong Emperor, and his grand project that he engaged with the pictures of tilling and weaving. Now, the exact nature of the pictures of tilling and weaving that Kangxi received in 1689 is not clear. It was recorded as a Song Dynasty version, which is to say uh, a 12th century version. So the Song is from 960 to 1279, um, and they were designed by Lo Shu, uh, who was a minor official, uh, approximately 1145. As you will see in the talk later, I have reason to suspect that Kangxi only received the poems that accompanied the pictures of tilling and weaving. So there's, there's two parts to the pictures of the tilling and weaving. Uh, there's images, and then there's also poems, and we're going to see them in a minute, but I'm still introducing them. Uh, well, actually, we're going to see them now. 
By uh, 1695, the emperor had commissioned his court artist and member of the astronomy bureau, Zhao Bing Jun, to paint images for the pictures of tilling and weaving. He also had them carved onto wood blocks for printing for public distribution. Kangxi composed his own poems uh, for the series. The paintings are presently lost, um, but they survive in the form of these prints that I'm showing you right now. As Kangxi had configured them, the pictures of tilling and weaving consisted of two suites of paintings, probably album leaves. In the tilling series, men are represented cultivating rice in 23 procedures. Um, this is from soaking the seeds, which is what we're looking at here. So they're going to, this basket is full of, um, well, grain and uh, rice, and they're going to put it in this uh, water and let them soak for a while uh, to start the beginning of the uh, sprouting. Um, and then uh, we also have a representation of tilling, uh, where the farmer is um, pu pushing a plow that is being um, pulled by a I presume a water buffalo or a bull or an ox. Um, and then we can also see as we move through the stages, through the steps, we can also see the reaping of the um, rice plants here, and they're taking them away, as well as eventually uh, we see them being placed into a granary. Uh, the storing of the grain. So you get a sense um, just from these few images of some of the scenes that occur in the 23 steps for the pictures of tilling. Now the pictures of weaving also have a series of images and they also go through uh, uh, the uh, process. Uh, women are producing silk fabric. Um, they, they start with bathing silkworm eggs. Uh, so they're getting them ready to start to hatch in spring. Um, here we see them, there's, they produce, they feed the silkworms once they grow, they uh, give them mulberry leaves, um, and then the silkworms produce cocoons, which are here, and what we can see is that the, this uh, woman here is reeling silk, that is, she's unwinding the cocoons in order to produce strands of silk thread, and we can also see that the silk thread then is uh, put into a, a, a warp, uh, structure to sort of start to organize uh, this, the thread so that it can be woven into. And uh, here we see a, an image of the plain weave. Um, there's a more complicated weave. Um, and so uh, what we can see is a woman seated at a, uh, at a loom and she is uh, weaving fabric. And then also we get a sense of toward the end of the making of clothes. So the women are bringing the bolts of silk fabric and they are now going to be cut and measured and made into, into clothing. So uh, as uh, Kong Shi configured them, we can see sort of the production of, of silk fabric made into clothing, as well as uh, producing uh, grain uh, rice for us to eat. Now, in addition to that, uh, you may have noticed that there's some textual writing, and this is uh, the thing about the, the poetry that I keep mentioning. So what we're looking at here is uh, a, you know, a large uh, image that has a, a big poem up here at the top. This is the poem that is reportedly uh, written by the Kangxi Emperor. This is in his uh, calligraphy. Uh, we Presumably he, he composed the poem. Um, and he very well might have, it's just that we don't know for sure. And what we have here in the little uh, section here is this, the original Song Dynasty poem, uh, as if it's um, were written on the wall um, that, is a, that surrounds the granary. So what you can see, of course, is that Kong Shi is kind of framing uh, this scene with his understanding of it. And he's also um, incorporating the earlier history, the Song history in it, um, in the Song text, uh, recognizing that this is a, a type of painting, a genre painting that existed before uh, the, Qing em the Qing Emperor. So um, what I think then is that when, uh, that in uh, 1696, um, when Kangxi was given that album, the pictures of tilling and weaving, I believe that that imagery, the original imagery 
um, the Song of the 12th century, it was lost or you know, we didn't know, he didn't know about it at the time. Kangxi's artist um, in all likelihood created new compositions for the poem after conducting research. Um, and we can see, as we can see, the scenes display the use of linear or geometric perspective. Um, and simply put, this is the illusion of a spatial recession that um, is created along diagonal orthogonal lines that converge on a point, a vanishing point. Jia uh, Bingzhen, as a member of the Astronomical Bureau, studied European mathematics and art practices from Jesuits at the court of the Qing dynasty. Um, this is a highly unusual use of European modes of painting techniques, and it may be the first sustained use of linear perspective in any court of China. Um, I should just point out that Jesuits had arrived in China in uh, 1583. So it's, uh, but, but there's certainly at, uh, there's a large number of them at the court of uh, Kangxi. Now, we can readily see the differences in modes of image making when we compare the Kangxi pictures of tilling and weaving with similar scenes in something that's called uh, the Bien Min Tu Zuan, or an, an, an illustrated epitome to benefit the people. Now, this is like a popular farmer's almanac that we might have in the States that was published in uh, 1593. And this is being uh, produced in the Ming dynasty. And um, the poetry associated with the scenes here is much more casual. It's more instructive in a way. Um, but here I'm now showing you that um, we can see that there's a sense of space that is created by uh, the use of perspective in the Kangxi um, imagery, which is on the left. And the plane weaving, uh, same scene, uh, there is no real sense of convergence. There's a use of parallel lines um, lines set on diagonals um, to suggest uh, a shallow illusion of space. Um, and again, it's, it's fine. There's, there doesn't have to be this need to, to create uh, three-dimensional space in, in the form of linear perspective, um, but yet it appears for, for certain that uh, Kang Shi wanted to have linear perspective in his imagery. Um, and I, I just also want to say that I think that the um, artist, Zhao Bingzhen, he was looking at this earlier material, uh, I think, to give him inspiration for his iconography. Um, uh, but um, I do want to talk about why Kangxi was so interested in having a linear perspective in his, in his commission. Um, and it's, it actually goes, I think, to a particular event that happened during his early reign. Um, and so there's something called the calendar case, which happened from 1664 to 1669. So monarchs in China, you know, across the history, and certainly including the Kangxi emperor, had to at least appreciate um, arithmetics, arithmetic mathematics and astronomy. These disciplines provided a means to proclaim imperial prerogative, that is the formulation of the calendar through which the empire experienced yearly and dynastic cycles. For Kangxi, like earlier rulers, the promulgation of the imperial calendar proved to be a very public means to demonstrate competency in the running of the state, as it was aligned with the order of the cosmos or, or the order of the seasons. Now this is kind of complicated and, and I'm not very good with math, I should say, but, uh, but I am just briefly going to say that the Chinese calendar, which is still in use today, is a lunar calendar uh, with, month, with months determined by uh, the lunar cycles, um, usually 12, um, but the moon cycles uh, vary. Sometimes you have 29 days, sometimes you have 30s. And as a result, the seasons do not always align with the solstices and the equinoxes. Um, so at some point, things are getting so kind of out of whack that an intercalary month is added in. It's kind of like a, a leap year. Um, now for Kangxi, the establishment of a calendar was particularly challenging as uncles served as regents. Um, in 1664, he was 11. And that was the year, again, the calendar case erupted. 
Um, it was very important for Kangxi to be able to identify the correct start of the year, which also was the inauguration of the agricultural season. And if you mess that up, it could be a disaster. So after the death of Kangxi's father, a Jesuit who had been in charge of the Astronomical Bureau was replaced by a Chinese astronomer. And by 1668, uh, the new astronomer advocated the circulation of an imperial calendar that included an unprecedented two intercalary months. So this was kind of, and this was extremely shocking. Uh, this had been many court officials, many courtiers and officials were really distraught and they regarded this calendar with great alarm because um, in all of uh, the Chinese history of the thousands of years of Chinese records, there had never been a year that had two intercalary months. Now, the Kangxi emperor was a student of Western learning and he regarded the calendars as a tool Oh, I'm sorry, he was a student of Western learning and he regarded it as a tool to produce precise and accurate calculations uh, for his imperial calendar. But at this point, he's under the control of regents. Nonetheless, when the two months, the intercalary months were proposed, he personally got involved in the controversy and investigated. Uh, he got his tutor and his Jesuit astronomer uh, came in to evaluate the proposed calendar and he contended that there should not be any extra months in it at all. Not one, not two, none. After a series of competitive tests between the Jesuits and the officials of the Astronomy Bureau, the westernized calendar or the calendar with the Western knowledge was won out. And, it, and in, now a Jesuit was named as the new director of the Astronomical Bureau. Um, through these and other maneuvers, uh, Kangxi surreptitiously managed to garner enough support to gain control of the throne, and he even placed one of his ruthless uncles in prison. So what we see is that Kangxi used Jesuit science to discredit the uncle. The calendar case reveals the young emperor mediating between factions in the astronomical bureau while having to uh, figure out and, and negotiate uh, Chinese cultural practices uh, through knowledge uh, based on Jesuit science. In this crisis, the competition between, between Chinese systems of knowledge production and Jesuit Western learning generated strife and even ultimately the death of an uncle who died in prison. So when in 1689, Kongxi was given the pictures of chilling and weaving, um, which, you know, as, as I'm, I'm going to argue, they act as a, you know, a poetic and pictorial interpretation of the cycle of the agrarian labor. I think he brought Chinese or Song agricultural traditions and Jesuit studies together. The introduction of linear perspective with its mathematical precision, um, bringing that into the pictures of chilling and weaving evokes Kangxi's successful resolution of the, cal the imperial calendar. And it also marked his proper ascension to the throne without any regents in charge. The emperor had an artist who was skilled in Jesuit astronomical knowledge and painting practices to present the yearly cycle of agrarian labor. In harnessing the subject matter of the pictures of tilling and weaving, Kangxi was able to appear uh, very knowledgeable cosmopolitan. He blended together traditions to form an identifiable Qing visual culture. And um, I should note here that the Qing dynasty is ruled by Manchus, which means it's considered as sort of a conquest dynasty. Uh, the Manchus came from uh, the northern, from regions uh, north of the Ming dynasty, uh, the territory of the Ming dynasty, and they were associated with hunting and not with sedentary agriculture. Kangxi's patronage of the pictures of tilling and weaving may have been a means for him to announce his knowledge of agriculture as well. Now I am going to get to Chenlong, I know, um, but but I'm I'm going I'm moving there. Um, Kangxi considered that his commission of the pictures of tilling and weaving as woodblock prints had an educational component. Now here we're looking at a long quote, um, but what you can see are some of the ideas that I've highlighted. Um, what I really want to emphasize is that uh, 
he, he's got this, these prints made, they're gonna be shown to his sons, grandsons and officials and subjects so that they understand the difficult labor. And again, it's very important to people, for people to understand how hard it is to make rice and silk fabric uh, so that it, it doesn't get wasted. Um, so he, he himself presented this in a preface to the uh, publication. Um, and so I, I want to emphasize that we can also see Kangxi um, displaying his knowledge of Chinese classics, um, the book of documents, for example, but more importantly, he's aware of the, the established roles of production of rice and silk fabric have in Chinese theories of governance as well. You know, they, you need your farmers to be happy. Um, they need to be able to produce and do their work. Um, the imagery of the pictures of tilling and weaving uh, represent an ideal society that works well when properly governed. The poems in, uh, that were originally associated with the scenes, uh, the Song versions, the 12th century versions, they could be critical of the government. Um, but Kangxi, he took their message as a way to advance good public relations. Um, and he informs viewers of the prince that he claims to understand the demanding labor and has concern uh, uh, for the welfare of the people. And then of course he wants his sons and grandsons to value labor as well. All right, so here we're finally going to start to transition to uh, the star of the show, which is uh, the star of my talk, I should say, which is Chen Long. But what we can see is that there is a series of emperors who would um, have commission and recommission the pictures of tilling and weaving. Um, and each would write uh, new poems. Um, so again, they would have the Kangxi iconography, and this is really unusual in, I think, the history of Chinese art, as well as I would just say the history of the world, where you have the same images for the most part. This is the uh, making the setting the warp uh, so that you can have the threads to weave into. Here you've got Kangxi's poems. Here you have, we're not going to talk about him, but this is this, his first son, while well, his son, Yong Zheng, uh, he's going to have his poems he writes. And then the grandson, Chen Long, is also going to have pretty much, I mean, the same imagery. And then he's going to write his poems. Now, I think that the writing of the poems is a means for the emperors uh, to show that they also understand uh, the value of labor. They are able to write these poems, uh, have individuated poems, so they have an individual, they've taken the time to write the poems, but they keep the images the same, which is just really fascinating to me. And I think that this is in part because the importance that uh, Kangxi regarded uh, the imagery. I mean, I think he took it over as a means to show uh, First, it, he has a lot of knowledge. He has European and uh, Chinese classical knowledge. And I think that the sons and grandsons also wanted to remind themselves that Kangxi had set this kind of vision up. Um, okay, so unfortunately, we're going to skip Chen or Yong Zhang, but now we're going to go into uh, Chenlong. And so Chenlong did his commission, but around 1769, Chen Long was amazed to discover that with the presentation of a Pictures of Tilling hand scroll, he was in the possession of what he regarded as the original 12th century iconography. So now you may have noticed I've been sort of not trying to say if what, it, what does the original uh, Song Dynasty iconography look like. And it's because I don't think they knew. And so all of a sudden, Chen Long finds out he's been given a scroll and he finds out, oh my gosh, this is actually the uh, original iconography. Now, the reason he can say this is because um, there are colophons attached, there are writings attached to the painting, and he's gonna talk about those. Uh, so this is a writing um, that Chen Long uh, wrote, in fact, and attached to the paintings. Um, let me go back. The paintings are in the uh, um, copies of the paintings, I'm gonna say, are available in the uh, Freer and Sackler galleries in Washington, DC. And so what we're looking at is uh, that tilling scene. And what we have here is a poem. Uh, the, this is supposed to be the original song uh, poem. It's written in a kind of a seal script, sort of an archaic kind of writing style. And there's, in case you can't read that and you read Chinese, the standardized script is here. And then up here we have uh, Chen Long writing yet another poem. Uh, inspired by this uh, this type of the writing that uh, was written in this in the song. Okay, so he gets this, 
and he's uh, very excited about this. And he explains that he believes that he has, um, because of the paper, because of the way the paintings are arranged, um, th that he has the original. So now he's just, this is a bit confusing. It's a UN artist here, but I'm just gonna say he's looking at carefully at the paintings. He's looking at the writing and he's saying, it. there's no doubt that it was the UN artist. Well, that's me telling you it's the UN artist. The Cheng Chi made these copies after the original compositions and wrote out the poems. Now, again, this is a claim that we don't necessarily have to believe, but, we, but it has been taken to be that these are the, the icon, the iconography, the imagery of the originals. So I just want to very quickly go over, there's a lot of time things going on. So in the Song Dynasty, we have the original, then now we have uh, Yuan, um, which is from 1271 to 1368. Um, this is somebody, Cheng Chi, he's copying um, the original um, in 1275, supposedly. Uh, Chen Long has these now. There's also the farmer's almanac version. I think those no have a connection, but ultimately going down here in the Qing dynasty, uh, we have Kang Shi who revitalized this, um, recreated images, but now Chen Long gets to say that he has the original. Uh, and so there I'm explaining uh, what I just said about the Chen Long's poems and here's uh, his poems as well. So um, Chen, Chen Long gets very uh, enthusiastic about uh, that he has these two scrolls. Um, and so um, what you can see, he's also claiming that, um, that he believes that the, the scrolls have sort of been reunited at the, as if the two swords at Yen Ford. Um, and so these are very important things and they should be kept in the um, Imperial Garden of the Yuan Ming Yuan Palace. Now, I'm not gonna worry so much about that, but um, the, the Yuan Ming Yuan Palace. But what we have here is that Chen Long um, looked carefully and gave it a thorough examination of the paintings, the seals, their placements. And he argued that he had 13th century version of it that was going back to the original 12th century. Um, so he also sort of saw that these works were miraculously reunited in his collection and that they ultimately constituted a profound gathering of good luck that signaled the magnitude of the heavenly blessings showered on his reign. So this issue of the two swords at Yen Ford, um, this is a Ming dynasty, I'm gonna say roughly 16th century story of the swords um, at a ford. And this is a story that can be summed up as you know, two knives had been separated, um, but then they were, they, but they magically possessed powers or agency to reunite. So the, at Yen Ford in the water, these swords realized they were close together and they came back together and they reunited. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but, but nonetheless, uh, for the emperor, this, this, this miraculous theme emblematically described the fateful and happy destiny of the 13th century scrolls reclamation. Driven by you know, cosmic forces, the pictures, of tilling and, the pictures of tilling and the pictures of weaving naturally sought each other out like the swords um, and wanted to be together with Chen Long. I mean, I'm, this is metaphorical, of course. Um, he, the emperor establishes their wondrous power and uh, connects the content, the subject matter of his scrolls with his father and grandfather. So again, what you can see is he's granting, and this is a big quote here, he's um, connecting uh, the possession of these original scrolls with the greatness of his ancestors. So, um, our late grand, August grandfather, he wrote title boards uh, for the pictures of tilling and weaving. And then his uh, late August grandfather, this is of course the Kangxi emperor, inscribed a set of poems for the pictures of tilling and weaving, made woodblock prints, which are current, um, you know, they're in, they're in circulation uh, in the world. Now that we have been able to reunite these two beautiful works, and as they concern the fundamentals of clothing and food for the common people, we shall have them engraved on stone, thereby proclaiming our family regulations for eternity. 
Um, the bringing together of the two purportedly 13th century scrolls is not only a fantastic event to solidify claims that the Qing dynasty values agriculture. This event is also taken to proclaim that Chenlong and his family are divinely ordained to triumph in governmental culture and art historical realms. Uh, Kangxi decided to revitalize the genre. Um, and during his grandson's reign, uh, the paintings are taken to be as if the originals, they have resurfaced. So grandfather and grandson uh, commission uh, Kangxi's iconography, um, yet the new, the new, um, the new, well, the new old paintings, the, the arrival of the Song dynasty, the 12th century, 13th century scrolls, um, they become a crowning achievement for Qianlong to affirm the centrality of the Qing era within the heavenly realms and validate the dynasty's just policies on earth. Uh, so, all right, with such cultural weight, Qianlong gave the scrolls an unusual honor and as he wrote, he had them replicated in stone and placed them in an imperial palace. He could have, like Kangxi, uh, used woodblock prints to disseminate his version. But given the gravity, the blessings the scrolls uh, embodied, the reproduction warranted a classicizing medium. Chenlong uh, regarded stone uh, with associations of immortality, uh, and he thought it was a fitting meeting a fitting medium to record his family's accomplishments. So in the process of proclaiming the divine status of the scrolls, Chenlong um, sought to make them public so that his um, greatness could be broadcast. The revered scrolls were transformed into stone for distribution and for immortality. Now, this is one of the, uh, this is a good photograph. I didn't take it, um, of one of the stelae. Now there were, uh, there are there were um, 48 stone stelae that were commissioned. Um, not all of them survive, and some of them are not in very good shape. Um, they're presently in the, Na the National History Museum in uh, Beijing. <clears throat> um, and I, I've only seen one of the stelae in, in person. Okay, but anyhow, um, so each stelae is approximately 52 by 32 centimeters. Um, and I'm going to talk about where they were placed in just a minute, but I'm, I, I want to talk a little bit about how this worked. So what you can see here is we've got the pictures of tilling, and this is the tilling scene. And here you can see, this is the photograph I took. I'm sorry, I know it's very bad. But you can see uh, the imagery has been slightly modified, but here it is as a rubbing and uh, up here. Uh, and so what would happen is, and just very quickly, uh, people would place a piece of paper on a stone, um, put some water on it, uh, push it down, and where the carving was, um, uh, the paper would, would, would sort of sink in a little bit. So what we can see here is that this, these people are taking some sort of soft tamping device. Um, they're putting ink on it from here, and then they're hitting the stone that has been covered with paper. And so what you can see is where the where the carving, where, where what has been carved out and removed, that remains white on the paper. Uh, it doesn't get filled in by the ink. So this is how a rubbing can be made from uh, a stone like that. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, again, these, these uh, stelae can act as sort of printing plates where uh, you can take uh, rubbings from them and then you can once the once the paper dries you can take them off uh, and then you have a collection of rubbings that sit, that re replicates uh, the imagery um, okay so uh, a complete set of all 48 rubbings of the all the 48 steles is present in is presently in the Huai Hai Tong uh, that's sort of the cherishing the sea collection here in, in, in Hong Kong. This, this suite was mounted as two separate hand scrolls, uh, framed with a yellow imperial silk and ensconced in brocade wrappers. The Hong Kong scrolls, for the most part, replicate much, if not all, of the iconography of the sort of the Cheng Chi, the freer, the, the, the pictures of tilling and weaving scrolls that are in the freer. Um, that is, again, the 12th or 13th century iconography. 
Um, but at times we find out that the rubbings, the images in the rubbings or on the stele are more elaborate in composition. For example, uh, we can see uh, the scene of reeling silk. This is when the silk is taken off the cocoons. It's put in boiling water. Uh, we can see that there is the inclusion of this sort of little vignette here, a little village vignette. This does not occur in the, uh, the scroll, the painted scroll. Um, uh, so uh, what, we, what, what we can see is that in the song poem over here, there's a comment that women uh, talk over the walls. They're so busy, they, everyone's doing this activity so they can have a chat over the walls as they take, they derail the silk from the cocoons. Um, this didn't occur in this image, but it did occur in this image. And what's very curious about it is that it appears in the Kongxi version. So now this gets kind of funny. And I think what we have here is that in the Sung, supposedly Sung stele, or the UN stele again, depending on the original iconography, um, Shenlong sneaks in a bit of the imagery from his grandfather's series. Um, and so uh, it's kind of charming in a way, but it's also sort of disturbing from our historical point of view. You don't want this mixing up of different kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of images from different places necessarily. Um, so I think that this is a very playful act that uh, Chen Long is doing. So he adds these extra figures in and he sort of folds in uh, his grandfather's uh, pictures of tilling and weaving in a very subtle way. Um, and so this is kind of like a kind of like an example of sort of interpictorial or intertextuality, which I don't know if I really want to explain it that much, but if you know, like if it's a kind of a theory or an idea when you write a story and you have characters in a story and then you finish the book and that's it. Then if you write a second book and you have just an entirely different group of people, but they might somehow manage to meet those other figures in the earlier story that you had written. So then you're sort of like, there's this background, there's this crossing of fictive boundaries. And I think that this is what uh, Chen Long is doing with his grandfather. He's sort of folding him into the Song original. Uh, but that's just kind of a, a wonderful little side thing. Uh, what I do want to say is that there's a larger, much bigger message here. And, and the frontispiece, uh, this, uh, these four characters, this is actually the start of the pictures of uh, we uh, pictures of Tilling Scroll. Uh, what we have here is something that uh, can read as Yi Chan Ban Ji, which is a way of saying um, the art presents the fundamental plan. And I think that this is a very interesting and invocative way for Chen Long to talk about how um, he has, you know, at one level, the artwork uh, is revealing how society should work as an ideal society. But more importantly, I also think it's a way of sort of showing that, that the art also participates in a way to demonstrate how significant and great the Qing dynasty is. Uh, again, it's sort of, a, it's a way also to affirm how Chen Long is this great guy and is able to have both sets of the pictures of tilling and weaving brought together, both scrolls from the song as well as his uh, Qing ancestors bring everything all together. Now, I did promise that I would explain where, and I see I'm running out of time, but I will show this fairly quickly. Um, Chen Long is going to put the stele in uh, the Garden of Clear Ripples. This is uh, called Qing Yuan. Um, and it's actually now called the Summer Palace. If you were, go, were to go to Beijing um, to see this, what I'm gonna talk about here, to see the uh, pictures of tilling and weaving in situ, uh, you would need to go to the Yihe Yuan. Um, and the name changed because of in 1860, uh, the Garden of Clear Ripples was attacked and damaged by uh, French and uh, English troops. Uh, because of the uh, Second Opium War. Um, so it was called the Qingyi Yuan, then it was partially destroyed, it had to be rebuilt, and then it was called the Summer Palace. Um, now the part that was destroyed actually 
was the area where the pictures of tilling and weeding had been placed. Um, so these are, uh, this is a reconstruction that dates from 1880, I'm sorry, 1998 to 2003. Now what you're looking at here is a corridor um, and this is supposed to be sort of a representation of where the stele would have been set into the wall. Now, they didn't put the stele there because they didn't want to, and I, I, I don't blame them. So what they did was they had rubbings or, you know, facsimiles of the rubbings uh, inserted in here so that you can still see sort of an approximation of the pictures of tilling and weaving. So this is the area here of the uh, summer palace or the ripple, the um, clear ripples, garden of clear ripples. Um, and this is where the pictures of tilling and weaving were situated. And this is kind of like actually a village. It's a functional village that was created uh, uh, to, uh, in, in, to, to actually house the pictures of tilling and weaving. And what you can see is there's a number of architectural uh, structures that were included. Um, and we know this because there is a text, there's a writing. We have uh, a, a publication of 1785 that describes uh, where some of, that describes that there were architectural structures in this section of the Garden of Clear Ripples. And so we have a number of names, the Studio of Jade River, Dwelling of the Waterfront Village, Studio of Cultivating Appreciation. Oops, sorry. We also have Temple to the Silkworm Goddess and the Bureau of Weaving and Dyeing. So this was actually created um, much in the way that um, uh, Dr. Bloom was suggesting that you might have a functioning village within a, a garden setting. So within a Qing Imperial residence, you have a garden, uh, a functioning farm. Um, and this is uh, the reconstruction of the studio of the Jade River. And as you can see, if you look very closely, this is part of the pictures of tilling and weaving. This is where that they would have been housed, at least according to this reconstruction. Now I have been there. I was really excited to discover uh, that there was a pictures of tilling and weaving scenic area. And I went to look at it and I, it was really charming. I found people dancing. This is my photograph. Um, the people were, you know, using uh, this as a space. Um, it's really very charming. And here's a view down the corridor. This is a terrible photo I took of one of the scenes and you can see I'm reflected in it. I apologize. I had meant to go back to Beijing to get better photos, but then, you know, I didn't because I couldn't. Um, and so here's again, more of the landscaping. Uh, here we've got a silkworm uh, a temple, a temple to the silkworm goddess. Here's uh, some of the landscaping. Um, they have since planted mulberry trees in here as well. This is uh, more of a view of sort of some of the village um, and uh, just some of the, the sort of belvedere's that they have they have created. So I'm going to very quickly wrap up. Uh, Chen Lung completed the working vi village with the inclusion of stele representations of what the village should look like. Chen Lung's poems to the pictures of tilling and weaving in either the Kangxi version uh, or inserted into the steles informs readers that he's a very diligent emperor working hard to ensure the prosperity of his people. Viewers of his stele, or, or Chenlong for that matter, could imagine that in moments of leisure, um, one could visit the ideal village at his home. So Chenlong could be at home. He could look at the stele and then he could look beyond them and actually see uh, farmers uh, uh, and their farmers both uh, harvesting silk and harvesting rice. Um, he could see the well-cultivated fields and groves of manicured mulberry trees, a physical realization of the perfect village that was theoretically at the heart of his realm and its prosperity. Um, the emperor might have watched the farmers irrigating fields or reeling silk, and he might have spent a night at the dwelling of the waterfront village after writing poetry to live a day in the life of the emperor as farmer. Um, okay, so while visiting the area, he could peruse the steles and admire his great destiny to possess the reunited scrolls that were reconstructed in his village with fields and mulberry trees. Perhaps he imagined that his great accomplishments were predetermined 
by his grandfather who had brilliantly acted in concert with the cosmos to revitalize the pictures of tilling and weaving. Um, to conclude, so um, Chen Long transformed the pictures of tilling and weaving into an architectural structure in a garden setting of a, of a village. The combination and play of different media uh, engage in a play of moving across media so it's like transmediality. And the subject matter is worked and reworked into various formats nested within and juxtaposed amongst each other. Uh, he's spanning architecture, village, garden design, and imperial residence. Through such monumental plays within art, Chen Long further sort of established the pictures of tilling and weaving as if an imperial brand, a vision of the ideal realm of the Song dynasty, the earlier dynasty, realized in the Qing dynasty and the kind of an agrarian theme park palace. Uh, Chen Lung possibly was striving to break down the barriers between the differing media to encourage an overwhelming sense that the classically idealized visual, the classically idealized village visualized in the Song and Qing pictures of tilling and weaving were actually there. They were in the, they were the physical village, the people in his imperial garden. The cycles of agrarian labor time and dynasty were perfected with the art presenting the fundamental plan. In the Garden of Ripples, the past and the present were fused and for Chen Long, with the attainment of this accomplishment, the eternity of the Qing dynasty and its great reign was inevitable. Okay, thank you so much. I, I did take a little longer than I wanted to, but I, I hope you have had the opportunity to uh, think of some questions. Great. So I'm back. Thank you. Um, I hope that wasn't too long. No, that was perfect. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we've already got some questions. Uh, first, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, I should let you drink first. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the poems, um, the contents of the poems? Are there any particularly interesting differences between the Song versions and the Kangxi or between Kangxi and Qianlong or all of the above? Um, well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, there, there is a great deal of difference because of the perspective of the person writing uh, or initially creating the pictures of tilling and weaving was not an emperor. Um, so in the Song, it was a minor official who wanted to uh, emphasize the role of the bureaucracy. Now, um, this is a, a trained civil service, uh, people who had passed an exam to become, uh, el to, be, to be able to assume very important posts in the bureaucracy. Uh, so they had to be learned men. And that role uh, was positioned as extremely important to help uh, both the people and the emperor have a nice balance in, in government. So it would be uh, the, the uh, official was sort of a pivot to help facilitate the farmer's needs as well as the needs of the emperors so that you know, the taxations could be just and everyone would understand the emperor needed some taxes to run the government and provide stability for the farmers. Um, and at the same time, uh, the farmers could uh, the under their labor, how difficult it was for them to work could be understood. At any rate, um, the poems in the original can be quite critical of the government saying, so this is not surprising because in Chinese painting theory and theories of poetry, uh, paintings I should ideally represent, uh, not in all cases, but they should represent sort of ideal social relations. That's sort of one of the one of the ideas, a guiding principle for painting, uh, at least classically. Um, and uh, poems, on the other hand, um, also are coming from within, and they are a space that is allowed to be critical. So people use poems, use songs uh, to criticize uh, or to have un, you know some things to say that are not so complimentary. Um, and this is something that was recognized very early in the Qing, or not, I'm sorry, in, in Chinese, the classics, uh, there was a collection of poems or songs that was made very early on in the Zhou era. So we're just going to say, let's just say 1500 BCE. There's a collection of songs. And theoretically, the emperor, the ruler, the monarch, 
uh, wanted these songs to hear these songs to know the songs, because if they were critical, he could understand that he needed to change some of his policies. Um, specifically now try, trying to get to the pictures themselves. Uh, Lo Shu especially is very critical of harsh, harsh taxation. So in the final image for putting the grain, putting the rice in the granary, uh, the Sung version says, you know, a child's going hungry because the, there's too many people involved in taxing. Uh, it's, it's not an appropriate level of taxation. Um, and the, the emperor is taking too much. Um, that, of course, is not the case in the uh, Qing uh, versions, which are, of course, are written by the emperor. So the emperor is saying uh, those ones are much more um, pleasant and pleasing and are more like, um, I'm doing a really great job and I understand how important it is. And there's no complaints in the villages. And I'm listening, you know, and I'm, I'm hearing actually the good classical songs of pos the good positive classical songs. So, yeah, the poems are very different. And, and, and what uh, once uh, Kangxi sort of establishes the themes for the, the poems, um, his son and grandson are going to kind of stick with that themes. So they're going to move some of the ideas around, but basically that sets the tone for the poems that they write. Great, thank you. Um, sort of on a similar note, um, are there are there differences in the ways that uh, particularly Kangxi and Qianlong approach the representation of agricultural labor? Like, what I mean specifically is. Um, are, are they always representing a kind of idealized song past or are, or are they representing contemporary practices, oh, contemporary right. Qing practices, or how does that work? Um, well, it does seem to be, when I look at the pictures, uh, the images, I don't see sort of references to explicitly to Qing uh, uh, clothing or Qing hairstyles, for instance. Uh, it does seem to be set in the classical past. Um, and set in a way so that that was uh, historically being claimed. But I think in part, the ideas that are represented are, are sort of being harnessed uh, as a way to argue that this, is, this thing that happened in the past is also present with us. Uh, in, in, and this appearance of the ideal society um, could look a little bit different, but, but we know when things were going well in the song. Um, and we're going to uh, use that kind of imagery to say that we can have it too. We can take over the imagery, we can harness its power, and it actually exists for us in our villages as well. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, that's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought about the uh, specific details of the clothing that, and the hairstyles. It's definitely set in the past. Um, and um, are there contemporaneous genres of imagery related to agricultural production or agricultural labor that do show contemporary practices as opposed to a kind of idealized representation of ideal society in the past? Um, well, I think that, yeah, there are. Yes, there are. But they're not of like, mm, there's other examples of agrarian labor per, and, and practices that go on with it, but it's usually from the imperial vision. Um, and by that, I mean, we have some images that represent a ritualized acts that the emperors and empresses do to promote uh, agriculture and sericulture. Uh, and so uh, we have sort of imagery of, for example, the son, Yongzheng, who I didn't talk very much about, he is represented as, you know, working at pushing a plow personally, uh, because he's doing this for that ritual in that um, uh, way to give um, uh, homage to the first agriculturist, uh, so that, again, as a demonstrative public act to show he understands the value of agriculture, we should thank or give homage respect to the first agriculturist. And so then there is this procession and there he is um, pushing a plow. And that's an opportunity to see some of the circumstances of plowing of, of that kind of labor. But again, it's very uh, pretty. Um, it's, it's very, you know, very nice. Uh, it's that actually the scrolls are gorgeous and uh, they're imperial. Um, and that would also occur, that kind of painting would also occur uh, in a series of 
hand scrolls that show the empress. Uh, and this is going to happen for Chenlong. His empress will be uh, presiding over rituals, over events um, that are classically inspired, that give homage and respect to the first sericulturist and uh, offering of cocoons. Um, and these are these have more uh, documentary quality to them to suggest that they really are uh, representations of uh, Qing people, Qing court culture, Qing, Qing this. But I, I think that any representations of farmers, such as I such as I can think, you know, farming, and by farmers, I mean women and men. So uh, some people are farming silk, some people are farming rice. Um, they seem to be taken over. Uh, it's almost like you cannot do them without having it be the pictures of chilling and weaving. Uh, that genre sort of became the template uh, in such a way that it's, you know, and, and the minute you start looking for them, they're everywhere. I mean, they're, they're on porcelain, they're in ink sticks. The pictures of chilling and weaving just show up everywhere. And I think it was a way visually to show appreciation for the Qing. Uh, these sort of things would also, you might wanna to give to the emperor and, and show your allegiance. You know, like, yes, I agree, we have the great society. Great. Um, a kind of related question, are, are there Manchu versions of the Qing sets of depictions of tilling and weaving. Um, are these, were these, or were these sets kind of meant to focus um, or meant to appeal to Chinese subjects as opposed to that? Um, um, I think, I don't think there was a split. I think that, again, the idea of what the message was, was about the quality of governance. So um, I don't think there were Manchu, the Manchu were, were the Qing. I mean, the, I mean, the Manchu were also these pictures of Chilling weaving in the Song, because uh, as, as Kangxi himself said, I want my sons and grandsons, I want my family to look at these images and know the hard labor that uh, the, the farmers undertake when they produce rice and silk. So it's important for everyone to understand this and society will be improved and benefit and be peaceful and harmonious if everybody understands what's going on. Um, and so I, I think, again, it may appeal to uh, the imagery may seem to appeal to Chinese uh, because of its subject matter. But again, I also think that shifting and in introducing that linear perspective was a means of updating it. And again, of sort of keeping it, yes, it, this is how agriculture should happen, but I'm gonna control the space and I'm gonna use that Jesuit science to show that I'm not just passively in, uh, endorsing Chinese cultural practices. I'm also manipulating them so that you will see how you know how smart I am. How how there's there's a greater vision of what can be done pictorially uh, with the imagery, not just relying on uh, you know uh, traditional modes of of making spatial illusion. Were, were there any Manchu language trans translations of the poet, the poetry um, was, was there, or um, I don't for that so. matter, Mongol or Tibetan trans translation? Um, I don't think so. Uh, it's very curious. Um, that's a really interesting question too. No, I don't think this was something that, uh, I think the pictures were meant to visually just cue you in to, oh, this is the pictures of tilling and weaving. These are the procedures. Uh, I'm not saying that these are the procedures that you would replicate, like you could look at it and know how to grow rice. I mean, um, you know, it's not really meant to be highly accurate. Uh, it is meant to be a highly accurate representation of, or application of linear perspective, that's for sure. But, um, you know, I, I don't think it was like that sort of a didactic thing. It was, I think, more symbolic. And I don't think the poems would translate well into anything but Chinese. There's the, even, and again, part of what Chenlong and, and Kangxi are doing is they're in those poems, they're demonstrating their knowledge of the Chinese classicals, classical theories of governance, of literature, of all these ideas. So they're sort of sprinkling them with a lot of stuff. Um, of course, that could be translated into Mongol or Manchu, but, but you'd have to know, again, the referent. Um, and I, you know, and I know that other things were translated. It's not like that can't happen, but it, it wasn't a priority. Great. Um, let's see. 
uh, where are the Kangxi prints held today? There must be several sets. Um, yes, there's there are several sets. Um, the, uh, there's a set in Nanjing. Um, that's the one that I used. Uh, there's a library, a, you know, it, it's associated with the museum, the Nanjing Museum, Provincial Museum. Uh, there's also uh, sets, plural, in the uh, National Library of uh, China in Beijing. I also believe that the um, there's probably Kangxi sets in the Library of Congress, if memory serves. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, they have some things that they're saying are original paintings by Kangxi or the Kangxi of Jiabingzhan, but they're not. They're, okay. they're, they're not. But anyhow, yeah. So there's, yeah. But they there are numbers of places. Uh, um, Taipei uh, also has uh, a, a, a complete printing, uh, a complete set of all the prints of the Kangxi version. Um, going back to the question of kind of translation and distribution. Do you have any sense of how many sets of rubbings were taken from oh. the Qianlong um, stele or who they were distributed to? Similarly, for the Kangxi sets, who ended up with copies of them? Well, the Kangxi is easier. Uh, I'm sure they were pretty much distributed quite widely. Um, I, I do get the sense that they were published. Uh, they were produced and published and distributed out, I mean, especially because we have even today a number of them. There's also some in the Stockholm I'm remembering now. At any rate, okay, so they, they went everywhere. The rubbings, now this is really funny because I believe I only know of about three or four sets. Um, and indeed, they're not even in Beijing. Uh, the stones partially are in Beijing, but there is uh, the best to my mind collection of the um, rubbings uh, are in Hong Kong. The, and they were recently purchased, I'm going to say within the past 10 years. Um, and they belonged to, a, to the what's called to the Somale family. Uh, so the Count Somale in the 19th century was a diplomat, a French diplomat who was in Beijing. And so he was there for a couple of years. And that is, um, I believe that's when he was, he got these rubbings. The quality of the rubbings of the, the, the Hong Kong scrolls, the Somali scrolls um, is really quite good. So I think they were probably made very shortly after the stones were carved. They're, they're very crisp um, as, as stone ages, things happen, it gets chipped or whatever. But these, these are really beautiful rubbings in terms of uh, uh, the quality and the, the cutting and you know the, the reproduction is they're just very sh sharp um so there's there is that uh that sort of version from the 19th century probably from the 18th century um that came to europe and then was repurchased into hong kong there's another collection that's not as complete that's in uh uh Cologne, Cologne, the Museum of Cologne. Um, those don't look nearly as nice either. They're more, they're not quite as nicely finished. They're a bit sloppy at the bottom. And I don't think the, the stones look as crisp. So that, I think those were taken later. Um, it's very curious though. You, he went through this work of, of, of essentially establishing printing plates uh, in stone. Uh, he put them in his private residence. So maybe people could not get the rubbings. Again, you would think that you would put this in a space in a public area so that people could just go and take rubbings. Um, so it's really curious. Um, there's another set uh, that exists. Um, also, uh, I'm not sure it's in a private collection. Um, and, and that's about it. Those are the only ones that I know of. Um, it, it, and it's very, very strange to me because that's a lot of work um, and they're not getting rubbed. Um, and, and that's clearly what he want. I mean, he did seem to, suggest that he would want to have those rubbings made because he wants to proclaim for eternity the greatness of his family's policies. So um, yeah, it's, it's very strange. In your talk, you mentioned that the Huai Hai Tang set was mounted in imperial yellow silk as two hand scrolls. Um, do you think that mounting is original? Um, uh, it's, it's a good question. It looks very good. Uh, and this, this, the actual silk has, um, uh, of course, a dragon woven into, dragons woven into it. And it is the five claw dragon. So again, all this is suggesting imperial. Um, 
Yeah, I, I like it. Um, and I, you know, I don't even like the, I, I like it as Qing. I like it as 18th century. I don't like the pictures of tilling and weaving, the paintings in the freer as Yuan or as like 13th century. I think that they're, if there were originals, and again, that's a really interesting problem. Uh, if there were originals, they must have been stored somewhere else. And these were copies that were made. Um, and those paintings actually was uh, um, in the collection of Prince Gong. At any rate, um, those paintings, I hope, are copies of the original, because if those are the originals, I don't know that, I mean, I'm wondering almost if somebody did a forgery there and Chen Lung really wanted it to be real or Chen Lung facilitated this kind of play of things, I don't know. It's not really clear to me that that painting is old, but I do like the uh, rubbings in the, the, in the Huai Hai Tong. Uh, they, look, they look good and they look very nice and old and, and this, the soap looks good. Right. Um, are any of, the, well, are, are the Qing images, the Kangxi sets and the Qianlong steely dated? Um, um, well, we, mm, uh, and are the it, poems dated as well? Uh, well, that's a good question. There's a, the pref. Okay, so the date is of the Kangxi uh, series. The prints they are dated to um, uh, 1696, and that's because of a preface that oh. he wrote. And okay. so those are. But again, those are the prints. We don't know when the paintings. The paintings had to have been done, uh, obviously, after he got the. Well, it's I, presumably after he got the pictures of Tilling and Weaving poems when he was on his tour and sometime by uh, 96, because that's that is the date for the prints. The the Stele, the yes, they have. Well, no, they don't. The inscription on the paintings when when he discovers that the paintings are of the UN era that replicate this the, the Song painting. That's dated um, to around to 1769. And um, presumably, again, so I say it's circa around 1769 for the um, stele and stuff, because presumably that's when he started. He got them and then he was like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to put these in stone, and that's when he commissioned them. I would imagine it. Uh, there's some record somewhere that says it took about four years to get them carved and finished, and I forget how I know that. Um, it could be that there's information in the park itself, in the Iho Yuan, um, in the in the Summer Palace, or there may be a document that says that. But yeah, there's some reason to believe that they were done within four years and installed. Do you know anything about? Um, the farmers who brought these tableaus, the tableau to life in the in the garden of clear ripples. Do we have any sense of <laughs> who, I know, you if there were actually people living there, or did they just bring in some people from the countryside on special occasions? Or no, they're pretty. They're pretty. Um, unfortunately, I mean, one almost wonders where they like. Yeah, I know where they were the actors brought in, but right. I, I think I think you would actually have to have people who knew how to do that. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that would probably entail bringing people in that were farmers. Uh, very interesting problem. Um, we also know that, uh, for instance, that this this um, observation of farmers. Um, now, the pictures of tilling and weaving is an observation of farmers that is uh, aestheticized, made into art and an art project. The, uh, Kang Shi himself um, had a uh, garden, or I mean, had, had, a, had a, you know, number of uh, palaces. And in one of his palaces, um, he would have a, a farm, but it was, and, and as well as a place for people to uh, produce silk um, at least the cocoons. I'm not sure about the weaving of fabric, um, but so that you could harvest, you could have mulberry leaves and grow silk worms and hopefully get cocoons. Um, the North isn't a great space for this kind of silk production, but at any rate, um, uh, Kongxi would also have a, a garden and he, or in, in, a, in a sort of a farm, but it wasn't an aestheticized farm. It was just for his, 
he was very interested in all, everything and he wanted to understand what was going on. So he would have farmers come in as well and they would farm and apparently one of his gardeners discovered a, a, a type of rice. Well, actually he, Kong, she claims credit for it, but presumably a gardener was able to either create or discover a strain of rice that could had a very short season, growing season, so you could have two crops in one year. This was something that happened in, at one of Kong Shi's um, palaces with his working farms. You mentioned there was a bureau of weaving and dyeing in, so was that an actual branch of the government or is that just a poetic name for a, or not so a bureaucratic name for a garden structure? Um, again, that, that does strike me as very strange. I completely yeah. concur. Uh, I was like the bureau, but but and even um, in the archive documents, the the dark you know the archival documents, it's sort of taken as the uh, as a bureau. Um, I I guess the idea there. I mean, again, it's it's it's, it's it is sort of an intrusive. It doesn't feel so. <laughs> friendly I mean like you know the what the village of the waterfront that sounds lovely you know that that sounds very nice a bureau for dyeing and weaving um I guess that might have something to do with sort of the idea that um these were structures that you know were benevolent that were introduced into villages as well uh because they, there is a need to have some standardization um and silk is, is notoriously difficult I'm not saying that you know, rice isn't, but uh, people would sort of, you know, at least initially in the song, people would pay taxes with silk. Um, and so sometimes the weaving women would get tired and they would sort of make the, the they would make some of the um, bolts of fabric too narrow or they would just make them not so densely uh, woven and they'd get stuck in the middle and then it would be counted and then it'd be like, who made this? This isn't very good. So there was a, a, there's always been a strong need to watch the silk because it could be very easily, um, the quality could be changed uh, if it wasn't carefully supervised. Um, so I'm wondering if there was like a lot of opportunity for, for supervision in the actual villages and Chenlong is you know recognizing that and putting that in there to Yes, it's good we have these uh, bureaus in our villages to check, but I don't actually know. I mean, I think that is an odd thing. It's fascinating, nevertheless. <laughs> yes. So one, one final question. Um, are there other books besides your own books um, that feature some of these kinds of illustrations of people at work? Um, are there any that you would recommend, either exhibition catalogs or other scholars' work or... Oh, sure. Um, Natalie, uh, but this is in French. Um, Natalie Manet uh, has done uh, a, a very beautiful book uh, um, that is, I just, I don't know, looking for it. I think it's at home. I'm in my office. Um, so Natalie Manet, M-O-N-N-E-T. Uh, she's working uh, at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Uh, so she, uh, there's, there was a purported paint group of paintings that were associated with Kongxi. They were stolen, but fortunately they had been photographed. And so they used these photographs that are quite nice. And um, it's it's hard to determine if they are actually uh, Kongxi. Cahill, uh, James Cahill, the great art historian said they weren't. Um, I, I can't tell because it's reproductions and all that. But at any rate, um, Natalie Monet's book is beautiful. Um, and there's also a publication from the National Library of China. Um, I'm gonna say about oh, 2002 maybe of the Yu uh, Jirgangjutu. And again, I'm so sorry, but um, it, that would be in Chinese. Uh, but in English, there's not a whole lot of uh, books on them. Um, another way to find out more about them, however, but it's not as art history. Uh, the Needham, Joseph Needham's uh, Science and Civilization of China, uh, there's a more of a history of science and technology. Um, they're discussed in those books, um, but uh, again, it's sort of like, these aren't accurate representations, which is, you know, which is a way to look at them, uh, but they were seen more as documentation of practices and they were found sort of lacking because they were too, too artistic. Um, those would be some of the obvious books, but again, it, there's not a whole lot of material out there, I think. 
Well, thank you so, so much, Dr. Hammonds, for this lecture. Oh, please. It was totally um, illuminating. Well, Dr. Blame, I really um, can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak and also to find out about your exciting project. <laughs> um, really wonderful. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the developments at the Huntington. So oh. thank you so, so very much. I, I really hope we can bring you here in person in the, in the future. And in the meantime, um, I just want to remind everyone, we have one more lecture on East Asian garden history this spring on Thursday, June 10th. Professor Yuriko Wakamatsu of Occidental College will be talking about the creation of a literati paradise in a valley filled with flowering plum trees in 19th century Japan. So I hope everyone will be able to join us um, for what I know will be an exceptional talk then as well. And please join me in thanking Dr. Hemmes once again. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much.